Hi, one of my off-stated goals with this website, and thank you for coming here to Light on the Rock, is to help us draw closer to one another, but first of all, even to God our Father and to Yeshua our Savior. And um, God the Father, how do you see him? Be real honest with yourself about this. God the Father, how do you see him? Really, in your heart of hearts, as God most high, the Father and God of Yeshua, yeah, it says in Ephesians 1, 3 and 17, the Father and God, or the God and Father of Jesus Christ, Ephesians 1, 3 and 17, we'll put it up there. And after his resurrection, he said to Mary, I must go to my Father and your Father, to my God, my God and your God. You don't often hear people talking about that. But anyway, how do you see the one we call God the Father, our Father, my Father? Uh, Yeshua taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Do you see him as a delightful being, a delightful person? Would you be loving it to have time with him, uh, for him to come visit, to drop in on you, to uh, have dinner with you unexpectedly? Uh, how would you feel about that? And uh, or do you see God? Do you see him as pleasant and happy and smiling and a wonderful, really wonderful being? Or honestly, do you think of God, and I think many do, as usually sad and dour and angry, upset? Okay? Or don't many of us also often think of him as sitting a lot? He's sitting on his throne. I'll hear so many prayers saying, So, Father, in heaven, blah, 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 and to Jesus Christ sitting at your right hand. And uh, there are verses that actually talk about Christ sitting on the right hand. Yeah, that's true. But I'm just saying in our mind's eye, we think of God the Father as sitting a lot. And I assure you, he is busy, and he gets up, and he has lots to do. And he sits on his throne at times. Now, do you ever think of Jehovah Most High as someone who enjoys life and has so much fun. Do you think of him as ever going out there and saying to Yeshua, I'll race you to the other side of the galaxy, I get Michael. And as they ride on the, on the carob, or the wings of the wind, as 2 Samuel 22, 8 says, he rode upon a carob and flew, carob and flew, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. I know that's poetic. But you know what? I, I do see God as riding, having fun, riding. I mean, some of you guys and gals love riding on your, on your Harleys, on your motorcycles. Our Father, I think, loves riding on a carob once in a while. His throne is between the cherubim, it says in Psalm 80, verse 1. How fun! How fun that would be! Just to visit him sometime, and in the future we will. And we'll be worshipful, we'll be respectful, we're coming in the presence of holy God. Absolutely, all of that too is true. But do you see, so today what I want to do, okay, my name is Philip Shields, I'm the host and founder of Light on the Rock, and thank you for coming. Again, the whole point of this is just to give you lots of different verses and concepts of God the Father that you may not have thought of quite this way. Do you think of God as enjoying a feast? Now, we know that Yeshua is called the exact copy, the exact replica, the express image, as Hebrews 1.3 says. Let's go ahead and post that on the, on the, on the back here. The express image. Hebrews 1.3 says, God, who at various times and various ways spoke in the past through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of God's glory, of his glory, and the express image of his person. He's the exact identical copy of God the Father. And he upholds everything by the word of his power. I mean, there's something we know out there that's keeping everything together. And so... Um, you know, scientists know there's something out there keeping it together. It says right here what it is. It's by the express uh, upholding all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1, 3, the end of it. My point, though, is as we know about Yeshua, we also can then transpose that onto the Father. A lot of times people uh, will consciously or subconsciously think of Yeshua as the modern. Uh, he's with it. Uh, 
I don't want to use the word woke. I don't do not. But he's with it and he's loving and he's kind. And of course, there's lots and lots of verses where Yeshua offended an awful lot of people. And offended. I mean, in John 6, it says a whole bunch of his disciples and people who were following him left when he said, you must eat of me and drink of my uh, blood and eat of my flesh or you have no part in me. And a lot of people left. He offended them. Uh, John the Baptist was offended uh, a little bit. And, and Yeshua said, are you being offended? Because of whatever, okay, he, I'll talk about offense sometimes, but he offended a lot of people. Certainly the Pharisees and the priests were offended at times. But what we know about Yeshua is that he uh, enjoyed feasts. My point is Yeshua had, uh, he certainly had that wonderful personality and all that, but there were times that he spoke very directly and sometimes offensively to people. He say took offense. Yeshua enjoyed, I mean, how can you get away from calling someone a hypocrite? In Matthew 23, over and over, hypocrite. And you den, of, you den of vipers and things like that that he would say. But anyway, uh, we know that Yeshua enjoyed the feast and he enjoyed a nice glass of wine. It says in Matthew eleven nineteen that he was actually called a wine bibber and a glutton. You're not going to be called a wine bibber and a glutton unless you're known for enjoying a nice drink once in a while. In uh, Judges uh, 9, 13, Judges 9, 13 says uh, wine which cheers the heart of man and God or God and man. So God enjoys a good wine, a glass of wine as well once in a while. And I think Yeshua certainly did. We know, we know Yeshua had some fun. God has fun. Yeshua uh, shows us the Father by being like him exactly. In the parable of the prodigal son, Yeshua even used dancing as an example of celebrating the return of the prodigal son, the wasteful son. And uh, so I, I'm convinced that when Yeshua would go to the wedding parties and things, that he would dance with them. I, I am sure of it. Does the father dance or is he too dignified for that? I think you and I are going to be surprised to see God the Father uh, at some point at, at the wedding supper or some other time when the dancing begins. There probably will be dancing. That he will, uh, he will say, I've been around a while. I've got a few moves some of you probably never seen. <laughs> Whether that happens or not, it wouldn't surprise me if it does. All right, God certainly, when he's in session, uh, uh, in, in session with uh, regal things and royal things, certainly would be very, very uh, formal and all of that. But I do believe God can enjoy a good drink, enjoy a good laugh, and enjoy a good dance. I really do believe that. Uh, the first uh, miracle that Yeshua performed was at Cana. The wedding feast at Cana, they had already run out of all the wine that they'd prepared for this feast. Run out. And these feasts would often go for days. And it was a humiliating thing for the host to run out of wine. And so um, Yeshua's first miracle was producing somewhere between 150 and 180 gallons of wine. It was near the Passover. Uh, the wine pictured his blood. He says to his mother, my hour has not come yet. So all of this was depicting his role, and he filled these uh, uh, urns that were used for uh, purification. Think about that. The, the wine, the blood of Christ purifies us. But anyway, he made so much wine of top quality that uh, everybody was so amazed. Anyway, so uh, Psalm 16, verse 11 is one of my favorite verses. It says, you'll show me the path of life in your presence. God, we're talking about here, in your presence is the fullness of joy. I mean, that's the epitome of joy when we can come to the presence of God and really know what kind of being he is. At your right hand are pleasures. Yeah, that's what it says. Pleasures forevermore. Does that sound like the way it would have been, it's been portrayed to you all along about God the Father? And, and being in God's actual pr presence, that, he, that you would feel the fullness of joy and laughter and smiles and having a good time and, in, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Why would you want to be around forever and ever and ever with someone who isn't fun to be with? God is going to be very fun to be with and we'll worship him and we'll glorify him and we'll love him. Yes, all of that as well. Let's talk about other things now, too. I'm going, to, I'm going to hit on maybe seven or eight things here. 
I've got to get back to doing something that I love. I haven't done it for years. I, I used to love to do some oil painting. Just, just watching these guys in the malls just paint the beautiful painting in about half an hour. And I started doing it, and I love doing it. I'm not great at it, but I love it. And so many times when I see a um, sunset or a sunrise or a rainbow, I just have to say, oh, Father in heaven, what a wonderful artist you are. And I look up, what a wonderful artist you are. And look, the colors are changing, you know, in the sunset. And you, are, you have such a great, the palette of your oils and so on. It's just so beautiful. I'm looking up and praising and thanking him and saying it and speaking it out. God is a great artist. Any of you who are artists, God loves art. He loves, he loves beautiful, beautiful things. Now, do you think of God as someone who collects things? Some of you like, I don't mean a hoarder. <laughs> I mean someone who collects, for example. I know people who have, have, a, have kept every single letter and card they have ever received from loved ones, family, whatever. Probably some incriminating things in there too, but every single one is in there. And they keep them stashed in a box somewhere. Once in a while they stop and go back and look at some. And Do you know that God knows every tear you've shed and why? Now, what I'm about to read might be a poetic expression of God's awareness of what we've been through, but it, it you know, I'm just saying it, it says a lot to me. It says in Psalm 56, verse 8, I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation, You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle your wine skin or bottle of water skin, you have recorded each one in your book. What does that say about somebody who knows every tear you've shed? Some of you have shed a lot of tears. Your husband has died, your wife has died, your child has died. My poor neighbor down the road here, within one week, the woman had a heart attack, Within that same week, her husband had a stroke, so they're both in the hospital. Within that same week, she found out that her child was full of cancer and died. Uh, when they opened him up, it was just not going to go anywhere, and he just died. All, all within, you know, that's a lot of crying going on, I guarantee you. And God is aware of that in us. He's a, he's a God at right hand, our pleasures forevermore. Let's read it again, Psalm 56, verse 8. Let's put it up. You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. I think that's such a beautiful, beautiful verse. It says a lot about my God, my Father, my Abba. Abba means Daddy, okay, loved, uh, loving Father. Let's move on. Do you ever think of God consciously as being polite and gentle? Polite and gentle. When Jehovah told Abraham that he was to sacrifice Isaac, his son, his only son, the son you love. In the English, it sounds pretty rough. In the English, it's take now your son, Isaac. Okay, that sounds rough. Uh, but in the Hebrew, it isn't so much a command as it is a request. In the Hebrew, there's no word now. Take now, your son. There's no word now in the Hebrew. That's very gentle. It's almost a please. As I, I was talking to a, to a Jewish scholar, a Hebrew scholar and teacher, a Jewish man himself who spoke Hebrew, of course, fluently. And he was explaining this to us one time that uh, in the Hebrew here, uh, what it actually is saying, please take your son, your only son, Let's put up what uh, the Young's Literal translation says. Genesis 22, verse 2 in the Young's Literal. They get the feeling of it far better. I'm talking about God's courtesy, His gentleness. And here's a verse you may not have thought of being a very gentle verse. So let's read it. Genesis 22, verse 2. And he saith, Take, I pray thee, or please, take, I pray thee, thy son, thine only one, whom thou hast loved, even Isaac. Take, I pray thee, thy son. Isn't that, to me, that's just very kind, very gentle, very beautiful. So, I, I just thought when I heard that, I had to pass that on to some of you. This is the kind of God I serve. 
can you think of God as ever crying? Now, I'm maybe going out on a limb a little bit here, but it does say very clearly, and again, remember, Yeshua is the exact copy, express image of God the Father. And the shortest verse in the Bible is John eleven thirty five, 35, when he went to where Lazarus lived. Lazarus had died, and there's a verse there that simply is two words, Jesus wept. That was when he went to see Lazarus' family. If Yeshua could weep, I assure you, our Father can weep. I assure you, the God being who created tear ducts and emotions can weep. I assure you, he does, because Yeshua did. I don't want to continue ever being the reason for him weeping, though. I really don't. You know, when he came to Jerusalem before his crucifixion in Matthew 23, verses 37 to 39, he's, he's overlooking the city, and he begins to lament the city. He doesn't say he cried, but he does begin to lament. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Matthew 23, verses 37 to 39. How I would have been like a mother hen gathering its chicks under my wings. I don't want you going through what you're about to go through. I wanted to gather you under my wings. I know what's going to happen in 40 years. 40 years. But you would not. You weren't willing. I'm going to give a sermon sometime on when God's will isn't done. This was a time when God's will was to protect them like a mother hen. But you weren't willing. So God lets us have free moral agency a lot of times. Uh, so remember that Scripture also tells us not to grieve God's presence, His Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4.30. In Psalm 78, verse 40, 41, let's read that. Psalm 78, 40, 41. How often they provoked Him in the wilderness and grieved Him in the desert. Grieved Him. Made Him sad. Provoked Him, made Him angry. Grieved him, made him sad. Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. I personally feel that during and after the gold calf incident, right after all these wonderful miracles, right after the covenant they made with between God and Israel, a marriage covenant, and after everything God had done for them, I really think that God was not only furious with that adultery with this other god that was made of gold and silver. But when you read the succeeding chapters after all that, I at least, I hope you can too, I can palpably feel his sorrow, his rejection. I can feel his grief. This is the god I serve. He can laugh. He can laugh real big. He can sing. He can dance. He can have pleasures around him. He can enjoy a glass of wine. And he can weep. He can weep. Don't you feel awful, though? He must have felt awfully rejected at that point. Don't you feel awful when you feel rejected by whomever, whatever? Do you think God and Christ understand that? In Isaiah 53, 3, it talks about Yeshua, the prophecy about him in Isaiah 53. And it says there in verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Goodness sakes, his own tribe, Judah, whom he loved, not only rejected him, but they crucified him. Sure, the Romans actually did it, but it was the Jewish people, his own people, who cried out, crucify him, crucify him. We want him dead. We want him tortured. And everything he was doing for them, this is all they could come up with. Imagine how he felt. Psalm 118, verse 22, says, says there that the, the stone the builders rejected. So he certainly knows rejection. So when you're feeling rejection, when you're feeling so awful that you don't even want to continue, someone in your family has said or done something awful and made you feel awful made you feel rejected, made you feel like you can't go on. You can get on your knees knowing God the Father and Yeshua. No rejection far deeper than you and I will ever experience. 
I'm going to move on. Some of you love bird feeders. I was going to hit a bunch of things, big things, little things. I do. I love bird feeders. Carol gets a chuckle when I talk about, oh, my redheads are, are there. I'm talking about the sandhill cranes with their red head. Maybe we can put a picture of a sandhill crane with a red head. So I call them my redheads. Or sometimes I call my redbirds, the, you know, the cardinals, and my chickadees. I go, she gets a kick that I call them my chickadees, my redheads, and so on. But I love to feed them. I love to go out there and give them corn or give them, um, give them sunflower seed, you know, for the, for the cardinals and all that. Do you know that God loves to feed the birds and the animals as well? It says in Matthew 6, 26, Matthew 6, 26, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather, into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value that your heavenly Father feeds them? He makes sure there's enough bugs, mosquitoes and things that they, <laughs> that they can eat, and bugs and worms and whatnot, and uh, whatever they all eat. It, somewhere it also says that he knows every single life that dies. A sparrow dies, he's aware of it. Can you think, I'm just hitting a bunch of points here, like popcorn popping up here. Do you think of Almighty God Most High as Daddy? That's what Abba means. That's probably the first words a Jewish baby, an Israelite baby would say, would be Abba. Abba. Means Daddy, or Ab. A-B. Ab. Paul says over and over that God has given us the Spirit of Christ inside of us, by which we can call out, Abba, Father. Look at Galatians 4, verse 6. Because you are sons or children, because you are God's children, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son, the Spirit of Yeshua, into your hearts. Yeshua was the Son of God. He's saying, I'm going to put my Christ's Spirit inside of you, and I want you to feel what Yeshua felt. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Abba, Father, is there some other way? Daddy, Daddy. So he says here, Galatians 4, verse 6, the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba. They actually use the Hebrew word here, Abba, Father. Because it means Daddy, dear Daddy. That's why when I pray, I don't like to just say, dear God. I like to say, Father, Daddy. My beloved Father, Holy Father. I'll say things like that. But you can say God too. There are prayers in the Bible where they just said God. But Roman, but I, I like the intimacy of Daddy. Now Romans 8 verses 15. It says we can call him Daddy. There have been debates. Can we call God the Father Daddy? It says so. Galatians 4 verse 6. I Put it up again. I just said that. I just read that. So we can call him Abba, which means Daddy. It doesn't mean just... Father means daddy, intimate father. Romans 8, verses 15 to 16, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. I don't want you to have a, a morbid fear of God. We have a fear to disobey. We fear him that way when we know we've done wrong. But we shouldn't go around with a morbid fear of our daddy. So he says, but you've received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba, here it is again. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So think of your father as Abba, Daddy. Now, moving on to other points. Do you men enjoy, and women enjoy building homes, building things, building structures? God enjoys building everything from little fly, butterflies to great big mountain peaks to whole galaxies. I just think that uh, that experience of creating the universe and everything in it beyond stars that we would never be able to number. And it says he knows every one of those stars by name. What an awesome daddy we have. What an awesome one. You know, I love getting out a hammer and saw when the kids were little and uh, sawing up some wood or hammering some things together or drilling some things with a screwdriver or, you know, power, power driver. And enjoyed watching them enjoy some of those things. And I'll do more if the boys uh, come around more and uh, get older. And even uh, 
even our granddaughter here, uh, she's, she's, she's not going to be left out either. But um, imagine how exciting that is to build the galaxies. Wouldn't it be exciting? I don't know for sure this is going to happen, but I, I, I can't see why not. Because we will be part of that family. And he's the creator, we'll be part of that creator family. Someday our Heavenly Father, who is the supreme God, who is the one who creates all things through Jesus Christ, now when he has other children, I can foresee that God could say, hey, Philip, what, whatever my new name will be at that point, how would you like to try your hand at creating a dog or a butterfly? Something small at first. Or something simple like a crab. <laughs> Just something fun. And I'll say, okay, so how do we do that? And, you know, but, but, and he'll watch me and he'll laugh and he'll smile. And, you know, and someday he might say, okay, I'd like you to build a star. I'd like you to create a moon. Wouldn't that be fun? I see my father like that. Life for eternity with our God is going to be fantastic. The other night I was reading the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 1 and 2 are pretty severe, to be honest with you. And I love chapter 3. These verses in Zephaniah are so loving, so sweet. Zephaniah 3 verses 16 to 17. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not fear, Zion. He says, Let not your hands be weak. Jehovah, your God, is in your midst. The Mighty One will save. Now watch this. Zephaniah 3, verse 17. He will rejoice over you with gladness. Can you picture God rejoicing over you? Hey, what's your name out there? Can you picture the Almighty rejoicing over you? If you can't, learn it. Believe it. That's the kind of Abba we have. That's one of the goals of my website here. Is that our website, all of it, it's our website, yours and mine. I dedicate it to God. It's his website. But that's one of the goals is to help us understand our Abba better. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. When my daughters were young, very young, I mean like one and two year old, I used to put them on my on, on my side here, um, here and uh, I play the guitar. You can see that on some Facebooks here and there of others doing it. And I did that when I was 25 years old. I'm 67 now. But I would hold my daughter, Rachel or Heather, in, here in my shoulder here area and I would play and sing to them. Not that I'm some great singer, but they seem to enjoy it, and I sure love doing it as well. Do we ever think of God quieting us with his love, celebrating us with song and singing? Do you ever? I just Let's read it again. Zephaniah 3, verse 17. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. Maybe we're stressed out, worried about things. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I love that. When I read, when I read that recently, I just had to stop, read it over and over and over and over until there were tears in my eyes because just to ponder such a powerful creator who even knows me, but apparently he does. He wants me to know him. And he loves me. And he wants to sing to me. That's what it says. That's what it says. Do you think of him that way? He wants to quiet your worries, wants your mind at peace, as he gently sings over you and me with a smile on his face. That's my Abba. That's your Abba. I want you to come to know him that way. That's the Abba I know. Isn't it wonderful? Do you and I ever think of God as enjoying singing that much that when he's happy, happy about you, he rejoices with you over singing, or over you with singing? That's what it says. One more thing I'm enjoying is I'm enjoying my wife. We've been married 45 years. Hasn't always been really silky smooth. I got to admit that. A lot of that was my fault. 
But what I enjoy a lot about Carol is discovering new things about her. Like I didn't realize how artistic she is until she's doing these pots that she's painting for a get together, sort of a Spanish theme. And the artistic uh, side of her is coming out that I never realized was there. I love it. I see her put together these floral bouquets that are gorgeous. I love it. Other moods and other things that are personal even, but I just love discovering more things about her as I go along. I'm looking forward to spending time getting to know my Abba so well and Yeshua so well that I discover new things every day or every week for eternity. They've been around a long time. There's going to be a lot to see and learn about them. I just love discovering new angles, new thoughts, new aspects of my wonderful wife. And I put that feeling and knowledge of that wonder and awe and the joy of finding that out over to my Father in heaven. He truly is ever going to be beyond being fully grasped and understood. But we're going to be with him forever and ever. And it's not going to be boring. It's going to be exciting. Uh, discovering more and more about him. Really heartwarming traits that our Father in heaven has. We could go on and on. We could talk about the beauty of God. The glory of our God. The power of our God. And of course the love of our God. And we hear about these things. But I hope that in this topic that I've covered here today, I, I hope I'm helping your mind to reach out a little bit, feel more intimate with him, how multifaceted and wonderful he is. I'm looking forward to having eternity with him because he's going to be fun, multifaceted. And he's made all of us different personalities. And I, and I think that I really think that each one of us, no matter what our personality is, when he's with us, we're going to really identify that, wow, what a wonderful being he is. I felt so, once I got over the wonder and the awe of it all, I, I, I felt so comfortable with him. So even the little few things I've mentioned here, we could go on and on, but hasn't that been fun? How God likes to sing to us. How God likes to take care of the birds and feed them and build things and all the wonderful things. He enjoys a party. He can cry. He can grieve. He collects your tears in a bottle. And again, we could go on and on about him forever and ever because that's who we have as our Father. So hallelujah and praise him. Worship him. Love him. Come to know him. And come to where you can honestly feel and know that you are coming to love him with every ounce of your being. That you love him with all your might, with all your spirit, with all your soul, with all your heart. With everything that's in you, you love him. And you obey him and you want to obey him. You want him pleased with you and you want to be pleased with him. And those who learn to see him and love him, he says this to them. I want to read this to you. Psalm 91 verses 13 to 16, because there's some awful things that are starting to happen out there. The rioting, the burning, the looting, the destruction. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. There'll be times it'll seem to get better and then it's going to get worse again until finally we're in the time of worst trouble the world's ever seen. I've mentioned in other sermons that God wants to, those who are praying uh, and, and searching for him and watching their spiritual condition. He says, pray and you know, watch and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape these things. That's Luke 21, 36. It's not in my notes here, but Luke 21, 36, in case I forget to put it in. But notice what it says about that. In the trying times coming, I want you to know this. There's also a, a story, it's in 2 Kings, I think it's chapter 6 or something, where Elisha, the prophet, was surrounded by all these enemy troops, and chariots, and his ministerial assistant was terrified. And uh, Elisha says, Oh, Father, God in heaven, open this man's eyes. And so he got opened his eyes and he could see these chariots of fire and chariots, angelic hordes circling above them, protecting them. 
and uh, we've got to we've got to live life more with that awareness that uh, we are God's children. We're working God's work, and He's going to protect. Look, look at this uh, Psalm ninety-one, verses thirteen to sixteen. You shall. This is God speaking. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample under foot. Now, the the lion was often a symbol of the conquering nations around him. Certainly, Rome. And, you know, we're, we're conquering, we're pictured by lions and a cobra could be picturing Satan himself. Because he has set his love upon me. Now here he's talking about you setting your love upon him. Okay. Therefore, I, God, he's saying, will deliver him. I will deliver him. I will set him or her on high because he has known my name. When we know God's name, it doesn't mean we just know it's Jehovah. It means that we know him and uphold his name, don't want to be an embarrassment to him. We want to uphold that name by the way we live and glorify and praise him. That we represent and protect that name that we are carrying as children of Jehovah, as Christians, Christians. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is the God that I serve. This is my Abba. This is your Abba. Please, as we come into rough times, It'll come and go. It'll, it'll sputter and start and stop, but constantly getting more and more frequent. The shaking will get rougher and rougher. Know that he will be with you in times of trouble. There's a psalm, I think it's 90 or 91. Though a thousand fall on one side and 10,000 on the other, I'll fear nothing for thou art with me. You know, um, this is my God. This is my father whom I know trying to get us to know him better and deeper all the time. I want you to come to know to get him better. That's the goal of this website. So I hope you keep coming. I hope you keep coming. Look at all the sermons we have. We have hundreds of sermons on here. We have hundreds of blogs on here. Blogs are the shorter written articles. You should study those too. So I can't wait, wait to meet my father in person. Uh, every time I pray and you pray, we're actually meeting him during those times too. But I mean where I can see him and see him right there. Uh, 1 John 3, I'll end with this, verses 1 and 2. When we're changed to spirit, it says we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 1 and 2, I often use this verse. Behold the manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it didn't know him. Beloved, now are we the children of God, verse 2, and it's not yet been revealed. What we shall be, but we know that when he, that's talking about God the Father here, that's the context. It's not talking about Christ here. In verse 1, he's talking about the Father. Okay, the manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. In verse 2, we are children of God. So he, we're talking still about the Father. And it says, but we know that when he, that is the Father, is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And I can't wait. I can't wait. I want to be sure to be there. If I abide in Christ, I will bear much fruit and I will be there. If I abide in Christ, he will see me to the resurrection. And he'll see you there too. Will you commit to hear the sermons I gave on how to win the fight of your life? especially part two, will you commit to being a victorious person in Christ? It's his victory, but let him give you that victory by abiding in him, searching out his word, thinking of scripture to combat every. Like I said in the sermon, go back and hear the sermons on Be Holy that I gave recently. Go back and hear the sermons and watch the videos. Make sure you're hitting where it says video, you know, so maybe we can show that real quickly. Uh, you can just click on the button and you'll have an audio version, but, but you got to come down just a tiny bit where it says video. Click on that and you'll watch the video. Sometimes we put graphics in there. Certainly we put up the scriptures in there. 
Anyway, I can't wait to be there in person with him. It's going to be fun watching everyone's reactions. Will you promise me that you'll do everything you can to be there too? Will you be there with me, my friend, my brother, my sister? Together we'll worship him, praise him, enjoy him. For at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 1611. Godspeed that day. Father in heaven, we bow our heads before you and we come before you and we just ask you in Yeshua's mighty name that you will fill our hearts and our minds and our brains and our whole lives with your presence, with your glory, with your love, with an awareness of who you are, dear Father. Help us to grow closer to you and understand you and get past all these wrong concepts that have been put, in, been put into our head by wrong religion. You're such an awesome, wonderful, loving, fun, and yet magnificent, awesome, holy, holy being, holy being. It's all of that. We honor and we praise you and glorify you. But we also look forward to being with you and seeing you as you are, like we just read, for we shall be like you. Because of your love for us, because of your love through Christ that you have let die for us and save us all through him and through that resurrection you gave him. We thank you. We praise you. We honor you. We can't wait to meet you, Abba. We can't wait, Abba. Shine upon us. Glorify your name in us. And let us be a good light and salt in this earth. We thank you in Yeshua's mighty name. We bow and worship you. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.